the recording. So welcome again, everyone. Thank you very much for being here today with us. It's a pleasure. We're always welcoming new students. Um, so it's great to see so many, well, so many of you already a trainee within this industry and um, interested in doing a master's. So we hope that today you will find what you're looking for. So you'll get um, a taster session of our new HR program that we've launched earlier this year. And um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Laura. Thank you. Thank you for being here again. You're very welcome. I'm excited mm -hmm. and happy to share my knowledge. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit about why, why I'm here. Why does GBSB Global think that I am the person best suited to uh, give this uh, webinar? Well, the first thing is I have, sorry, that's automatic. <laughs> uh, the first thing is that I have a experience in handling teams. I had my own small business for over 12 years where I had to handle, of course, not just the admin tasks and having to sell to clients, but also managing the team. So I've had lots of experiences. Some of them have been very, very pleasant. Others have not been so pleasant. Um, but that's why I'm here to explain to you um, what kind of challenges you can find in today's workplace. I actually have a, um, my background, academic background, is um, a bachelor's degree from the City University of New York at Queens College and I studied media studies and then I actually moved to Spain um, almost 20 years ago um, and I got my master's degree at a uh, Catalan business school here um, in Barcelona named Deal and I got a master's degree in marketing. Uh, since then I worked in multinational companies, I worked in very small businesses, and um, in 2007, I decided to create my own small business. My small business still exists today. I sold it in 2018. It's called Crystal Events. Any of you who are interested in getting married and getting married in Barcelona, you know who to call. Uh, Crystal Events is a company that uh, was created to help people who are living outside of Spain to get married here in Spain. So. Um, there was a lot of work that had to be done from building the, the company up from ground zero and also managing lots of people. So like I was saying, um, on my end, it wasn't even just managing people within my own team. It was also managing all the providers, which on a specific wedding day could run up to 30 and 40 people. So like I said, I've had many different experiences. Um, since 2018, I have been in the higher education field sharing my knowledge, which is my second passion, uh, sharing my knowledge with a uh, generation of people that have an inquiring mind. And I like to talk a lot, as you guys can tell, which is why I've also been asked to be speaker at different conferences and events. So now we are going to dive right in just to review for the people who weren't um, who weren't uh, on Sorry, let me just stop that. For people who weren't connected five minutes ago, if you guys have any questions, uh, just raise your hand. There's a little icon on the MS Teams. And if the question is not too complex, I'll try to address it um, at this moment in time. And if it's a bit too intricate, then I will uh, address it during the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So before we actually begin and talking and begin talking about HR as we understand it today, the first thing we need to understand is what is HR management? Now, I know there's some of you who are already in the field, others who are interested in getting in the field. Basically, HR is important because it is a key aspect of uh, any organization. And in order for the, bus the business organization to be successful, we have to be able to understand and manage our resources accordingly. Um, human resource management is not just submitting payrolls and it's not just uh, making sure that everybody is at their job post at their uh, specified time. It's a lot more. It's about being able to um, coordinate, uh, control, but also organize and plan ahead for uh, needs that we may have in the workforce in the future and in the immediate um, in short term, shall we say. So it's, it has to do with recruiting, employing, and compensating, which basically what it helps to do is it helps the, the organization to be able to um, take everybody's full potential and be able to contribute to the success of that organization. 
So there are lots of terms that are related to HR, and there are lots, uh, lots of words that are used interchangeably and that increasingly become more and more um, repeated in, in the business world. Like, for example, talent management. This is uh, part of the, the webinar that we have today. This is part of the, uh, the master's program that you guys have. It's about talent management, people management. It's a lot, it's a lot more than just, um, like I said, making sure that payroll is being done quickly. There have been roles that have come into play, like chief happiness officer. Why are these, why are these terms such important aspects of human resources today? Well, one of the most important uh, aspects that we have to cover in the business setting is not only being able to capture the best talent for your organization, but also being able to retain the best talent for your organization, which is why job positions such as chief happiness officer, which is basically there to ensure their employees' well-being and also well-being and also ensure that there is a high level of employee morale, motivation, etc. That's why these people exist. And then there are other terms that you guys are already more familiar with, like labor management, personnel administrator, etc. So what is the nature of human resource management to begin with? Well, human resources is a mix of many different skill sets. Basically, it is comprehensive. It involves all types of people within the organization, no matter uh, what job function they are performing or what hierarchical level they are at. It is also people oriented. It has to do with the human relationships that we establish within the organization. It is also employee oriented with uh, specific skill sets being developed for that employee, training being developed for that employee, which will foster employee satisfaction and the employee's growth within the specific organization. Then it is also action oriented where it helps, for example, uh, in the resolution of conflicts or other situations that can come up that will help an organization to reach their goals, but also help the employee to reach their own um, goals. And then it also has to do with developing skills and again, getting back to training, which also help employees not to increase their morale and be motivated at this moment in time, but also to help them advance in the career that they want to have and to be able to achieve that growth within the organization so that they can develop their full potential. Now, um, the type of functions that we can see in the, in the human resource management. First of all, it's a pervasive function. What does that mean? That it is inherent, it's basically made up, and it consists of um, functions that happen in all organizations and at all levels, no matter if you are the CEO or if you are the person at the front desk. It is also results-oriented because Human resource, what it looks to do is being able to allocate the resources and plan for the future and plan for now so that the organization can reach their goals. Then it is also a tactful approach and people centric. Why? Because what it looks to do is it looks to deal with human emotions. Humans cannot be treated as uh, machines, for example. So what it looks to do is being able to identify how you are to approach each specific person and how each specific person can be motivated. And so the way that you approach, for example, Susan in accounting will be very different though than how you approach the same situation with, I don't know, with um, Jolene from the marketing department. Then it's also an integrative action because it involves every single human being in the organization. And of course, it's something that is continuous. It's a dynamic, ongoing, never-ending process. It's not just uh, about getting the payroll done at the end of the month or about being able to cover, to cover that vacancy. It's something that never ends. It's continuous. So we also must remember that uh, one of the worst things that can happen to an organization is that waste um, human resources are wasted. Sorry, whoop, hold on. Sorry, guys. 
What we need to understand as human resource managers is that we have to ensure the maximum potential of all of our human resources, of all of the people that work in our organization in order for us to maximize the organization's productivity. So there is a basic need uh, to find a balance between the needs of the organization and the needs of the employee, which has two different uh, significances. We've got professional significance and social significance. Professional significance, what does that have to do with? Well, it has to do with the organization providing their employees opportunities to reach their maximum potential. Then, of course, it has to do with maintaining healthy, um, good relationships between the individuals that work in this organization. It also has to do with being able to allocate work properly so the person that is the most qualified is in the correct job position at the right time. And the social significance has to do with the employee's needs, where uh, the employment is that they have suitable employment that provides social and uh, psychological satisfaction to the employees. It also has to do with finding a balance between job seekers, the, all of those people that are unemployed and looking for a job or may not be unemployed but want to switch jobs, and being able to being able to find the balance between the jobs that you currently have available in your organization and matching them based on professional uh, skills, qualifications, needs of the organization, etc. And of course, we are able to eliminate wastage of human resources via the conservation we conserve physical and mental health within our organization. So how has human resource evolved through time? Well, there was a time where um, human resources weren't even, it wasn't even an aspect of a business. Before the Industrial Revolution or even later after the Industrial Revolution, basically people were looked at as tools uh, with which they were able to have a specific productivity and therefore make money. Around the turn of the last century, um, there were businesses or um, thinkers, shall we say, that started to see the need for employees to be looked after, for bringing up um, employee welfare. Trade unions started popping up around the 1910s in specific countries. So there definitely was a need to be able to um, retain and take care of your workers. Between uh, 1920s, 1930s, that's when personnel administration um, began and was defined as such, where here basically we were seeing, people were seen as tools, but now there were other things that were starting to be looked at, such as um, the proper compensation for that person to be doing that job, having a specific hour so that uh, the employee welfare was already was also taken care of, etc. Then personnel administration, where we were just controlling and ensuring proper compensation, etc. That transformed into personnel management, in which now it became important for um, organizations to not just think about whether or not the person has gotten their paycheck on time, but also if they are looking to uh, develop themselves professionally, if um, perhaps you would like to that person to take on more responsibilities. Then around the 1970s, 1980s, this is where uh, HR started popping up. The actual term human resource management popped up and that is when there became a shift towards uh, human resource as we understand it today, which is not just looking after our employees' welfare, making sure that they're getting paid properly or they are in a healthy, um, good workspace, but making sure that you can get and plan with your employee for them to be able to reach their maximum potential. In the 1990s, that is when the transformation uh, was consolidated, shall we say, and people were really understanding that human resource is a very important aspect that needs to be covered in every organization. And at the turn of this last century, roughly 20 years ago, that is when strategic human resource management popped up. And now HR managers and the component of HR in an organization is not just a control function where 
it's coming from the higher levels of the hierarchy and trickling down to the bottom and the HR manager just um, provides the information that has to be done for certain policies to be followed. But human resources is also an aspect of the board of directors or the executive partners in which strategic decisions are made, taking into account the human resource aspect of an organization. So as you can see, within the last hundred years, there's been a huge transformation into how uh, human resources are approached within an organization. So what is the difference between personnel and human resources? There are still people that to this day use these terms interchangeably. And as you've seen, they're not quite the same thing. So let's take a look in detail. The administrative function is, an, is a personnel management function, which what they want to do is ensure that they have the right person at the right job, basically. Whereas human resource management looks to uh, looks to attract, develop, utilize, and maintain, retain the best human resources for their organization. Personnel management has a more limited and inverted approach. It's more, um, how can I explain this? It's a bit more egocentric. Whereas human resource management has a wider scope. It's not just looking at what is most beneficial for your organization, but also looking at what is more, what is beneficial for your employee for your employee's development. In personnel, workers are still viewed as tools, whereas in human resource management, workers are considered an asset to the organization. And there are many organizations, one of them being AliExpress, for example, that uh, for them, the most important people within their organization, and they communicate this um, and have no issues say, stating so, is that the most important asset in their organization are their employees, not their clients, their employees. Personnel management looks to focus on managing the employees' adherence that they follow the policies, the rules, the guidelines, etc. It's like we can think of it like policing. Whereas human resource, what it does is that it ensures that we have the right quality and quantity of human resources in our organization and that we are using we are making the best use of the workforce that we have in our organization. What does this mean that whereas in personnel, there may be a person that is in the purchasing department, let's say, who decided to get their own master's degree in HR in this great business school called GBSB Global. <laughs> and um, the HR department in that specific company who's just devoted to personnel doesn't do anything about it. However, a company who is more um, oriented towards human resources as uh, being able to see workers as an asset, what they will do is they will, they will identify this worker who has, with their own money, decided to, on their own time, get this, get this uh, master's degree in HR and now decides to change them and transfer them from department from the purchasing department and transfer them to the HR department because they see that that is the best fit for them at this moment in time. Then personnel uh, management basically sees uh, involves recruitment, hiring, staffing, development and compensation, whereas human resource management also uh, includes these terms, but also includes the coordination of people at work again, because this ties in with being able to utilize the right people at the right time. And to finish off, personnel management is centered on achieving organizational objectives, whereas HR management looks to also achieve an organization's uh, success or organizational goals, but through the use of developing their employees full potential so that the organization can in turn be successful as well. So what are current challenges that we have or that we are facing nowadays in in this field? Well, of course, we've got issues like the global business environment. There are no borders, there are no frontiers, and really any uh, key player in one specific market can decide to enter another market. And therefore, this means that people are also recruiting the best talent from all over the world to work all over the world. 
um, managing remotely is also another issue that we have to face uh, nowadays because it's not just about recruiting people. Let's say I'm going to be recruiting from somebody from Stockholm to be working in my organization. My organization is in New York City. The person is working remotely. Okay, I've recruited that person. Great. Now I actually have to manage that person and I have to understand how not being in a physical uh, same location, how I'm going to be able to manage them correctly. Then we have other issues like multicultural teams, multicultural issues. There are people who have are very well traveled and have lots of have had lots of contact with people from other from other walks of life, from other countries, from other races. But there are other people who have not. And so it's important to be able to develop these multicultural skills to be able to work in today's um, world. Then there are other issues like, for example, um, technology. Does the organization have the right technology for being able to um, being able to work within this new, more competitive sphere? Then intellectual capital, adaptability, etc. One of the things that we have seen, and I'm sure all of you guys have seen it as well, is that the organizations that were, for example, uh, the, the ones that were quick, quickest to adapt to home uh, working from home when the pandemic struck around the world are the organizations that have persevered. There are organizations that were not able to adapt so quickly and they are still struggling and some have even ceased to exist. So these are just a few of the human resource management challenges. Now, um, when we talk about uh, human resource management today, of course, we need to address given that we have seen that there's a global business environment and people are now being uh, HR managers and managing remote teams, it's important that we take a look at what eHRM is, electronic HRM, and digital HRM is. Basically, electronic human resource management, as you guys can see here, textbook definition is planning, implementing, and applying information technology for being able to network and support at least two individuals or collective individuals in their uh, performing or um, creating their HR activities, carrying through their HR activities. Digital HR, however, is a specific process which still under uses information technology. However, it relies uh, heavily on SMAC technologies, which is social, mobile, analytics, and cloud technologies and these are leveraged to make HR a more efficient, a more effective, and more connected process within the organization. So this can sound like very textbook and theory, but I'll get into the nitty gritty of it right now. Electronic HRM. Well, these are the kind of types of electronic HRM that we can find in an organization today. We can have operational EHRM, which, is, which has to do with the administrative functions like payroll, like um, um, handling the employee's personnel data, what is your social security number, medical records, sensitive information, etc. Relational EHRM has to do with supporting the business processes. So here we have to do with, uh, we can, it's very self-explanatory. It has to do with basically the relations and what kind of relations can you have in an organization? Well, things that have to do with uh, workshops, training, uh, career development, performance management, uh, yearly review, peer review, etc. And transformational EHRM basically has to do with all of the strategic activities. So here it has to do with uh, looking at uh, what are the future forecasts for the organization. Are we going to expand into another country and therefore we're going to need to hire on a new group of people. Are we going to transform into and expand into a different market where we're going to need new skill sets, et cetera? It has to do with, uh, all of these have to do with transformational EHRM. Now, digital HRM has to do with four key aspects. First, we are looking for HR efficiency. We look to invest in and build platforms that will help to efficiently manage HR processing through existing HR technology providers. We also look for HR effectiveness, where we use the technology to upgrade practices and people. What does this mean? When we are doing stra uh, staffing, recruitment, uh, peer review, communication, et cetera, we use this technology 
in order to help us manage people. Then we also uh, build on information because, of course, in the HR department, we we handle lots of sensitive information. Um, there is information that is both internal and external, etc. And here, depending on the information, there can be strategic information that is shared with the rest of the organization, or shall we say, the um, executive partners, the ones who make the decisions. These are used in order to create business impact. Now, what does this mean? When we have data that we are sharing, there may be uh, data that we are using um, that is being used in order for a, an organization to make a strategic decision. And now I'm not talking about, for example, how many people bought product A. We are looking to see, for example, how many people have, um, have taken sick days off how many people, What during what time of the year do most people end up taking their vacation days? What other aspects that are going to be relevant to the uh, optimum running of the organization are important for us to understand and important for us to leverage? And then we are going to build on the connection and the experience of the employees here. So here we are using digital HR to create a connection between people. Uh, aspects such as, and I'll go into this uh, in detail in just a minute, but aspects um, that before were not taken uh, so much into account because they took place in the physical setting and now have to replace, have to be replaced somehow. So how do you replace them? How do you replace the water cooler chat when everybody's around the water cooler and they're, they're um, chit chatting? Or how do you replace the human connections that are created when you are waiting for the coffee, for your coffee by the coffee machine. This is, these are connections and um, relationships that are built within the organization and which actually help the organization to be more uh, human, shall we say, because we are not all machines. We are not uh, at all machines. We are humans who need to have that social interaction. And so there is an aspect of digital HR that covers that entirely. So we are going to take a look at the six stages of digital transformation in an organization. And we're going to take a look at how Target has been uh, working in their HR department based on this digital transformation that they have chosen. Basically, there are six stages which begin with the business as it is today and ends with uh, transformation or digital, um, a digital transformation in which basically technology is used throughout all the processes and are ingrained in the company's DNA. But first, let's begin with stage one. Stage one is known business as usual. Basically here, companies are focusing on, um, on uh, keeping, maintaining, or growing the existing value uh, for stakeholders and shareholders. Uh, stakeholders being our employees, being our partners, uh, etc. The organizations that are in this um, category are usually very, very um, shy in terms of taking risks. They are not daring. Many of these organizations are under the idea that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, why do I have to transform if uh, everything has been working up till today and it's been working fine? Lots of businesses before the pandemic were in stage one and were very averse uh, to change. But they have been they've gotten a real shove <laughs> towards the digital transformation because of the needs that they had at that moment in time. And it's one of the reasons why so many companies have changed. In these kind of organizations, the organizations can be seen as more um, limiting because they, the business culture itself does not allow for a lot of innovation, creative thinking, thinking outside the box. And so people just don't do it. And the leaders, the management uh, staff in these organizations basically are just not, um, not fans of change. So here we can see, for example, different aspects of the organization and how they are within stage one. When it has to do with leadership roles, for example, interdepartmental relations are not collaborative in managing, for example, the customer experience. And there is no holistic customer view promoting silos. Silos are different um, strategic business units within an organization. When it has to do with its people and its operations processes, 
we can see that there are there is no formalized uh, protocol or no um, responsibilities that have been specified or processes that have been put in a protocol for everybody to do the same way. Perhaps there are departments that work on their own and use specific technologies, but it's not integrated into the organization. For the customer experience aspect, the business strategy is focused on current customer needs without thinking ahead, without thinking of the future and the trends that are taking place in the marketplace and seeing how they can adapt. In terms of data and, and analytics, there is no unified uh, measurement. There are no KPIs that are put into place. So if there are any ideas of change, they may happen within a uh, specific department, but not overall. For technology, IT, the IT department controls most technology roadmaps and the individual departments only have uh, specific experimental digital solutions for them. For example, what does this mean? Uh, when I was in, an, in the marketing department in a pharmaceutical company many, many years ago, IT was the one, was, was the king. And IT was the one who decided what kind of software we would, know, we would use in the marketing department, for example, to create our, uh, sales, our sales information. But I, want, I wanted to be able to use Photoshop. But 20 years ago, this was something that was not widely used. It was seen only for artists and it was seen only for graphic designers. So these are the kind of things, these are the kind of limitations that you would find in terms of being able to uh, make digital changes in your organization. And then digital literacy, to what degree are the employees and the management staff um, accustomed to dealing with technology? Well, um, everything that has to do with digital literacy basically has to do with the current customer needs. As long as the current customer is satisfied, and there, then there's no reason to change or improve. Now, stage two of the digital transformation is that technology sparks experimentation. So there are specific change agents in the organization, which could be a new manager or it could be a change of um, CEO. But basically, these people see opportunities pop up. And what they do is they, they try to lead experiments within their own specific department. They may not be able to make change across all levels of the hierarchy and across the entire organization, but they start within their own department. These people usually um, are early adopters. Early adopters are the people within, um, for example, digital, mobile, Internet of Things field that um, look to experiment. They're OK with uh, being the first ones to use a specific technology because they like that aspect of technology. And their mentality is, you know what? Well, let's just get started. And if the CEO gets mad at me, don't worry, I'll, I'll cover your back. I'll talk to the CEO. But it's basically that it's let's see what happens. And then if it doesn't work out, then we'll say, oh, sorry. But if it works out, we'll say, look, we've been using it for the past six months and it's working out. So these exper this experimentation, what it does is it really pushes boundaries and it starts to create momentum within an organization to transform. So stage two of digital transformation, when in terms of data and analytics, basically here, it's that marketing and digital begins focusing on the customer experience analytics. So there are a number of uh, specific metrics, specific measurements uh, that are put into place and that are started to be studying. With uh, the competitive experience aspect, companies in stage two are basically being led to rethink the company's approach to the customer experience, basically due to what's happening in their, in their um, field, in their market. What is the competition doing? They get shoved into these changes sometimes just because they have to keep up with the competitors and not so much because they actually are change agents themselves. In terms of uh, the leadership and management uh, staff, basically they um, are done by change agents, like I said, in their department. And what they do is they use this experimentation. They include these disruptive technologies and they look at they look to uh, leverage new opportunities. In terms of people, operations, HR, basically the experimentation in these emerging channels allow uh, for organizations to rethink 
not only their customer service, not only their customer experience, but also their digital customer experience and their own employee experience and see how they work well in their organization based on current, um, current processes and current uh, hierarchies. The technology integration now looks to explore you know, platforms, channels, tools, etc., and measurement within their departments. And the company's digital liter literacy now is actually uh, increasing due to the change agents. And basically, these are looking elsewhere for inspiration. They perhaps uh, follow lots of tech talks, or they are um, they are very very much into um, the innovators. They perhaps Elon Musk is their their king and they get inspired through this. Companies in stage three basically um, is what happened to lots of the companies in the pandemic. It's that urgency now accelerates the change. Now there is an urgency to modernize the customer experience based on having to keep up with the competitors, based on maybe the competitors have uh, started to get a piece of their pie many it can be due to many reasons and in this stage efforts are actually focused on specific areas that are strategic for an organization's success and here specific opportunities are explored and they are experimented upon this uh the organization in this stage also starts to develop a roadmap or shall we say a blueprint a journey as to how the organization is actually starting is going to start to transform from its current state into a completely digital state. So stage three of digital uh, transformation. In terms of data and analytics, here there are specific um, aspects that have to do with metrics that are identified, areas where they may be lacking, and they start to look to begin collaborating among uh, departments. The customer experience is also looked at through the customer journey. And basically here, what they want to do is identify issues within or opportunities as well within the customer journey to understand where they can make decisions that have to do with the digital customer experience. The leadership and governance um, aspects of the organization what they do is they start to look to optimize the efforts and the resources within their organizations by looking to have sponsorships or rallying, getting other departments to, to step in and help. In regards to HR, companies here um, in this stage are looking to gain traction. So they are looking to gain more and more momentum, like a snowball effect. We can think of it like that through pilot programs or uh, other kind of programs. The technology integrated into the organization at this point is basically uh, purchased to help each individual job role, shall we say. It's still not thought of as something that can be integrated throughout the entire organization. What it's done, it's being, they're basically buying technologies based on the needs of each specific um, person and also looking at the different stakeholders within the organization, mapping them out to see who has more influence, power, et cetera, and also looking at the touch points between the organization and the customer throughout their customer journey. And digital literacy in companies that are in the stage three of digital transformation is that now we are looking to uh, prioritize executive education. What does that mean? That here, what we are looking to do is uh, sometimes by the change agents or sometimes by other uh, sponsorships, et cetera, is that the board of directors, shall we say, the executive partners who have perhaps been more risk averse in the past are now starting to see and understand the value of this digital transformation. And so there are actually training programs that are set up so that these people become more accustomed to the new technologies that are going to be placed in the organization. Stage four of the digital transformation are companies where uh, they begin to formulate, they begin to create and establish how they are going to make strategic changes. So now uh, a change or the efforts being put in in terms of resources, both human, uh, physical, 
in terms of infrastructures, technological and uh, financial, are now being put into digital transformation, and this has become a company priority. The roadmap has now been specific, specified, it has been refined, and now it is even uh, broken down into short and long-term goals. And the change that is being done throughout the organization is now starting to be supported by dedicated infrastructure and operational investments throughout the organization. What happens? Companies in stage four now have to start recruiting, have to start recruiting people with different skill sets that they didn't require before because of the digital transformation. So now these skill sets are hired basically to be able to um, cover and basically do all of the tasks that will be required with this new technology. And the technology that has been that has been chosen by this at this moment in time is now not just for a specific job role to cover a specific need, but it the technology that has been um, implemented has been done with a specific purpose in mind and it has been implemented in the organization in order for the organization to achieve their organization's goals. So in stage four, data analytics, well, we can see that now there's an omni-channel approach where uh, there are specific metrics being put into place like uh, loyalty, uh, content, engagement, etc where the company looks to have a more, um, shall we say, a dedicated and general um, view of everything that happens within the organization, both um, internally and also with their stakeholders. The customer experience, both digital customer experience and customer experience have now become an official priority and now there are specific uh, functions being done like uh, group studies, uh, behavioral studies, preferences, etc. In terms of the leader, uh, the leadership uh, level managers of the organization, well here it's the entire organization that is on board that has seen that there is an, a need for change into the digital era and the efforts are now much more ambitious. They are formally organized. And like I said before, there is a lot of money being put into this as well. In terms of HR, in terms of people and operations, well, there's uh, official momentum at this point. Now, the company is actually putting money where their mouth are, as we say in English. And change is something that people in all different hierarchical levels, not just the change agents that are inspired by early adopters, but everybody in the entire organization can see as something that is important and has to be done for the organization to continue succeeding. In terms of technology integration, well here, omni-channel tools. Uh, omni-channel has become an important aspect of, of this uh, stage four level organization. And so omni-channel tools are integrated into the company's technologies along with customer relationship management software, et cetera. And in terms of digital liter literacy, now executives and all other departments receive mandatory digital um, training, both in the new technologies, but also in customer experience. And HR specifically looks to explore how to attract these new skill sets that are required and the new expertise that is required. Stage five, is that now the transformation is now in the company's DNA. There have been new processes, teams, uh, business models that have been created to be able to unify different roles and processes and be able to streamline the company's operations in order to deliver superb customer experience. The technology is purposeful, both uh, facing the customer and both in the back office, behind the scenes. And the digital transformation actually expands beyond digital customer customer experience and is now uh, a part of every single aspect of the organization, whether you are in HR or whether you are uh, in the sales force. So stage five, the digital transformation in terms of data and analytics, basically there is now a combination of data that has been that has been done in order to be able to collect data from different kinds of sources so that we can end up getting a more complete view of our customer in the organization. The customer experience 
Now all customer experience touch points in the customer journey have been have been planned and have been specified so that the organization can be more successful in being able to attract and retain that specific customer. Leaders are now um, really working hard on the digital transformation efforts and they have actually reshaped the organization uh, into what it is today using and creating new business models and creating new standards. In terms of HR, people in operations, well, the digital transformation efforts that are taking place now have expanded beyond the digital customer experience, but has now become a part of the entire business itself. In technology integration, these companies become a more comprehensive uh, cloud-based or experienced cloud organization using the technologies that will help them to combine different data sources so that they can optimize both digital customer experience and collaboration throughout the organization. And in terms of digital literacy, all the employments, all the employees, excuse me, are trained on the uh, company's specific digital strategy and the candidates are hired based on their ability, based on their skill sets and how they can actually integrate and add value to the company's digital uh, transformation. And so stage six, we have now uh, overcome all of the hurdles and now innovation is a top priority in an organization. It is part of the lifeblood of the organization. Digital is now uh, the way in which the company competes, the way that it uh, approaches change and is continuously transforming as technology evolves and as markets evolve. Innovation becomes part of the company's DNA and these organizations have a variety of programs that range from test and learn pilots to the introduction of new kinds of job roles, positions, et cetera, to partnerships with an investment in uh, startups. And these organizations also invest heavily in their people and processes and technology, always thinking of business, ex business optimization, employee experience and customer experience. So to finish off stage six, data and analytics here, there are specific metrics that what they do is they look to showcase business value. And you can, you can use these metrics in order to uh, measure customers from a 360 degree perspective. This is like when you guys have been in contact with organizations and suddenly um, you read their content and you're like, oh my God, mm, are they reading my mind? How well do they know me? They, they know me very well, but it's like they're in my mind. This is what um, it has to do with here. The customer experience is basically driven by um, innovation and the unification of every touch point in the customer journey as the company continues to improve over and over um, and becomes continuously evolving towards, in, towards innovation. The governance and leadership aspects of these organizations basically have a focus on new business models, new roles, and investing in more innovation focused, um, shall we say, innovation focused activities or programs that will help the organization to be able to adapt much better and to be able to maximi maximize opportunities that pop, that pop up to grow. In terms of people and operations, these new roles that have been um, identified are basically focused on managing the transformation in the organization and being able to uh, study and um, identify future issues that can come up um, in terms of disruptive technology and future issues that can come up that can uh, impede the organization from being successful. Technology integration at this moment in time is an experienced cloud technology, which is integrated across all functions with the specific business units that are uh, involved in the selection of new technologies for their specific uh, organization, for their specific business unit or silo that will help them to support innovation within that specific business unit. And digital literacy here has to do with employees that now have the skills that are required to be able to innovate, to be able to think outside the box, 
um, whether and it's it has to do with managing people so that they all feel like they can contribute whether they are people that have just started in the organization or somebody that has been around for 20 years so let's take a brief look at target which is which has gone through of course stage one two and three but we're going to review stage four five and six of their hr digital transformation today so in stage four Remember, uh, in stage four, they are now understanding that change is important, but they are not investing as heavily and putting efforts in as much as in stage five. But here we can see that targets uh, HR leaders. What they do is they look to foster um, the skills of the people that they have within their organization already. So, for example, the company's digital uh, team has already partnered with HR with uh, specific HR companies, headhunters, um, innovators, et cetera, that will help them to map out strategies so that they can get uh, the right people in the right time in their organization. So this has to do with what? This has to do with talent acquisition, specific training strategies for people that are already in your organization and that perhaps have the skill set or can develop the skill set to be in, an, in a different position. Um, being able to maximize their full potential. It also has to do with um, being able to identify hurdles and obstacles in that organization and being able to remove them and other aspects. Targets stage five. So now in stage five, what we see is that an organization has now understood that there is a big need and is also aligning all efforts. Like I said before, both phys physical, financial, technological and human into making that change happen. And here, for example, uh, with Target, their HR department promotes that young team members have a lot of say in their organization. So they try to get their ideas heard in a systematic way. Now it's not just about, well, you know what, guys, let's have a brainstorming session and talk about how we can improve Target. And maybe it happens once a year. Now it's being created the process being is being created in a way that it's going to be much more systematic and repetitive so that way there's not a need to actually create brainstorming sessions that only happen once a year but you are able to leverage even the slightest um, idea light bulb that goes off in your workers minds and being able to look at all of these ideas and see if there are any opportunities so as um as we can see here jamil ghani who is the senior vice president of strategy and innovation for Target says that they're trying to find more ways to empower these team members through specific different events. And this information, what it does is it helps them to make better informed digital decisions. And in stage six, where Target has now become uh, digital is now ingrained in their DNA and now their digital transformation and innovation focus is complete. And so here they are continuously evolving and innovating. Well, we can see that Jamil Ghani, who is who, as I quoted before, saying that um, saying that their their organization has become a critical innovation center. And so what they did was their San Francisco offices, which I believe are Target's headquarters. I'm not entirely sure now. What they had to do was recruit a lot of people who had the specific skill set. So the San Francisco team evolved to include project managers, engineers, and designers who were able to execute on the technologies that they were exposed to, like Internet of Things, virtual reality, gaming, and much more. So this brings me to the end of the section about the six stages of the digital transformation within an organization which now uh, makes me address the specific HRM trends that are taking place today in this in this day and age. And I see that I'm I've already gone a little past our time, so I'll try to be brief. Like I said, I like to talk the top HRM trends. Well, the first one we are already very familiar with it is that many companies are now having their people work from home. And even though the lockdowns have subsided, there are many companies that have said that they will continue having their teams work from home. There are other organizations who are saying that they're going to adapt, adopt a, excuse me, a hybrid workplace where employees have more flexibility. They can 
for example, my husband's organization, he works in a multinational company, and they've said that they can choose how many days a week, whether they want to work fully remote, whether they want to work uh, half time, and which days of the week they want to work uh, from home and which days of the week they want to work, uh, they want to work in the office. There are certain issues that this um, that have to be addressed, of course, here. The first thing is, well, are the companies going to be paying? And I haven't put this here, but do the companies actually pay for the for their people uh, internet connection? For example, do they get a company laptop, et cetera? There are some companies that do, and there are com other companies that don't. This is something that uh, pops up. Then uh, situations like home readiness. Is the home big enough to be able to have a proper workplace that has all the ergonomics in place so that people are comfortable, there are no issues with postures, etc. Technology issues, perhaps if you live in an area where there are continuous blackouts like happens in certain countries, well, perhaps you will have more issues being able to work from home. Then there are issues that have to do with um, the always on mode. Since I'm home, I don't ever have a way to actually disconnect. Unless I actually have a physical office, I can't close my office door and say, okay, well, that's the end of my day. Now I'm going to get into my pajamas and work, which of course can lead to burnout. Then we've got issues that have to do with managing people remotely. Like I said before, it's a lot harder for us to be able to check up on our employees if we don't, if we don't see them. How can I see if there's no, there's no timetable for me to see what time um, they came into the office, for example. So it's a lot more challenging to be able to understand uh, how your workforce is doing. So there is a heavier reliance on technology for us to be able to stay connected and to be updated on our employees' productivity. This has resulted in regular departmental check-ins, for example, in order to see how everybody's doing. And then, like I said before, then there's a lack of uh, human connection. So what some companies, companies have done is use different online tools to be able to foster this human connection. Like, for example, having virtual happy hours where everybody's connected, they're having a beer by their computer, but it's a virtual happy hour. They like to replicate this camaraderie. Then telepresence is another aspect. Telepresence, basically what it looks to do is it looks to replicate, even if you are in a different location than everybody else, it looks to replicate that you are in the same place as everybody else. So you can see here, we're not seeing these people, these gentlemen on the screen, we're not seeing them with their, um, you know, lovely frames in the background and stuff. They all look like they are sitting around the table. Then there's also an aspect of HRM in the digital era that has to do with artificial intelligence. It has to do with machine learning. There are specific tools that we can use to be able to automate specific processes within human resource management. For example, we can use tools to automate and screen thousands of CVs that you wouldn't be able to do uh, in that same amount of time. Then there's other uh, screening software that what it does is it identifies the skill sets of the existing employees that you have in the organization, not just skill sets, but for example, academics, um, um, hobbies, basically anything that will help us to understand what can make the, the most qualified person for that, or for that uh, specific job role. And what it does is it, it cross references this with the actual candidates that have been that have sent you a CV for their for their for the job vacancy and these these uh, AI tools what it does is it allows us to rank grade and be able to create a short list for the candidates that are um, the best suited then there are also AI powered chatbots for example during the um, recruitment stage there are many uh, times that the organization will have to reach out to the candidate for further information, etc. Well, the chatbots can be programmed so that there's nobody that actually has to be man manually um, putting the information in, either in an email or a phone call, etc. And this not only does it allow the human resource team to, of course, make better use of their time, but it also allows the candidate to have a better impression of the organization because they are aware of every step in the in the process. There is also uh, digitized interviews. Now, what does this mean? 
I'm sure you guys are familiar with biometrics. Biometrics are what allows us to use our uh, fingerprint to turn to access our cell phone, for example, or uh, organizations where you have the fi facial recognition software in order to enter your office, etc. There's a lot of different things that we can that we can look at. Well, basically, digitized interviews. What it does is it makes use of this facial um, recognition software to see and be able to assess um, how candidates are feeling, for example, and to be able to assess if they are a good fit for the role, if they are good for the organization. It also looks at other things like speech patterns, uh, the specific words that the candidate has been using, et cetera. Basically what it does is it looks to help the HR team to make the best decision and being able to hire the best uh, candidate for that role. Then again, Multicultural management, as I explained before, it's one of the biggest challenges of today where different frames of references can create misunderstandings. We can't think that everything in other countries works the same as in our country. You basically can't, can't take for granted. And since remote teams don't have the, those interpersonal relationships that we create around the water cooler, then it becomes even more important to be able to create those human connections in some way. So, for example, when let's just think about sending an email when you send an email and if you are American, well, then you expect an immediate response, even if it's a response to say, thank you for your email. I will review it and get back to you as soon as possible. However, if you are a Spaniard, it's OK if you don't get an immediate response. It's OK if uh, the other person takes three days, four days, even a week or two to get back to you because they, this is part of the culture that is ingrained in the in the um, country. And remember that culture can affect um, lots of aspects of a person's work life. First of all, the work ethic. Are they people, for example, one of the biggest differences between American work ethic and Spanish work ethic, which is what I have um, seen is that the work ethic in the United States is a lot more about getting things done. You maybe are in the office for eight, nine, ten hours, but you're there and you're working the whole time. However, in Spain, you may have a longer work day, but you arrive late. You can go take a breakfast break for half an hour. Then you take a lunch break for two hours. Then you get back to doing a little bit of work. Then your colleague comes to you and starts talking to you about, oh, did you see the Barca football game this weekend? And so their productivity levels are different because their work ethic is different. Then uh, culture and values also affect our workplace behavior and our etiquette. What does that mean? The way that people um, dress, the way that people uh, carry themselves, their manners, etc. Punctuality, like I said before in the beginning of the webinar, to some of us we started on time, to others we started late, to others we started early. So depending on the culture that you're dealing with, you will need to understand what is considered impunctual or not. You will need to consider their value system and of course understand their moral code basic beliefs of what is right and wrong. So why do we want to study a master's degree in HR and talent development at SHGBSB, excuse me, global to begin with? Well, the first thing is that we need to remember that HR professionals are, as you guys have seen, they are a very important aspect of the organization because basically they are able to allocate and retain and get the best out of the employees, which in turn will always make the organization uh, successful. The program that we have developed here at GBSB Global is going to help you uh, gain a very broad knowledge and a very in-depth understanding of HRM. And it also includes the latest industry trends that are going to help you uh, move into the next level of your career. So, um, there are certain aspects of GBSB Global that I'd like you to become familiarized with. The first thing is that GBSB Global is a leading innovation and technologies business school. And you guys can take a look at this and what this actually means on our website. It's all up there for you. But basically, we have accreditations from a number of different awarding bodies around the world. We have been rated five stars, five out of five stars. Um, 
by uh, for teaching quality honor by the QS ranking system. We are a Microsoft school and we also have received three top scores in U multi rank for research, teaching and learning and international orientation. Then at GBSB Global, we also have faculty members. So the professors, as you can see me, I'm one of the professors, have real industry experience. We all of the staff that teach at GBSB Global, not only do we have our academic background where we have our bachelor's degrees, master's degree in specific fields, others, there are professors that also have PhDs, but also we have real life experience in the field that we are actually teaching. So here you can see the our faculty is also a very big array of nationalities, which also will help you to become immersed and familiarized with multicultural management, where you can see 72% are European teachers, but not just from Spain, from all over Europe. So you also get lots of different uh, regions as well. And not only that, but we also have a number of different programs um, and we have guest speakers that are always um, part of our of our curriculum activities in which they come and talk about their organization issues related to um, different topics, etc. Of course, this will allow you to have a real great opportunity to learn from people who have experienced these situations and have understood how a business is conducted for real. And we also have a very diverse student body, just like we have a diverse uh, faculty body. We also have a different, a diverse student body with students from all over the globe, over 100 different countries. And you can see here that we have uh, people from all, every single continent. We are just missing Australia, and I'm sure that that will change very shortly. We also have at GBSB Global a practical approach to education using state of the art interactive study materials. So not only is the fact that we are a Microsoft school, but we also uh, help you guys to become familiarized with the technology that is being used today. So you will have you use and access Office 365. You are able to chat with professors and classmates. There's a virtual learning environment with state of the art um, tools that you will become familiarized with and that way you can be able to develop your skills in terms of technology as well. And at GBSB Global, don't take our word for it. The organization, the organizations that our students have ended up working that working at due to networking events that we have, um, helping them connect with startup entrepreneurs or consolidated organizations, etc. speak for themselves. So this is just a sample of some of the organizations that our graduates have gone on to work at. Then we've got uh, freedom and flexibility with 24-7 uh, access to study materials. And we have an anytime, anywhere approach to business education, which means regardless of whether this is an online course or a uh, on-campus course, you have access to the study materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so you can benefit from both our uh, world class faculty, diverse student body and other networking opportunities, regardless of whether you are taking this course remotely or you are doing it in person. So here I've actually included the landing page for your uh, for this specific masters, which uh, you guys can explore on your own. Here it is. You can take a look at lots of the different information, teaching, career opportunities, etc. This brings me to the end of my webinar, and I'm sorry because I know that I've gone um, a little bit over the allocated time. Does anybody have any questions? Hi guys. Hi guys. I'm back on. Back on. <laughs> No questions. no questions. Well, it's probably because I spoke so much on a stage <laughs> that everybody's like, I don't even know what to ask. <laughs> well, oh. we've actually um, had quite a lot of questions asked online because of uh, quite a few of our viewers are working. So unfortunately, they weren't um, able to attend um, or stay on until this in this hour uh, but we've had quite a few questions maybe i could start off with those and if um if any of you feel 
um, that you want to ask anything else in oh. addition, feel I free to will. either write them in, in chat if you don't wish to kind of speak I'll up. I'll be with the questions and turn off my camera one minute because I need to drink water. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, thanks again for such a detailed um, outline of the industry and the program itself, actually. Um, I think we've pretty much covered the structure of the program and even going back to what you said about the current challenges uh, within the HR industry, um, I think it's quite clear how our particular program tackles, um, you know, the trends and the challenges that we currently face within the HR industry. So as a school, we do always um, focus on diversity and inclusion and creating that global environment where people will be able to interact with each other and see the cultural differences and learn to work together the best way possible um focusing on empathy understanding etc um so one of the questions asked let me just read it out i'm sorry was um since we are moving towards digitalization further and further what are the key tools to develop a corporate culture um online so without having that um you know classical setting how do you as you said, we are moving away from the people's touch almost with more and more technology being in place. How do we create that united corporate culture? What do you think are the best tools? Um, does that Would make sense? Take that, Anastasia? Um, yes, please. <laughs> but do tell me if... Well, the first thing that we need to remember is that every organization is going to have their own online tools. So I can't <laughs> say... Zoom is the best, or I can't say MS Teams is the best. Every organization, based on their specific needs and the investments that they've made in technology, are going to have their, their tools. There are organizations that may even create their own tools. They may even have their own IT development uh, department that's going to create the ad hoc tools that they may need for the organization. Now, as an HR um, manager, what can you do? regardless of whether the tools you are using are uh, Microsoft or something else. Basically, it's going to be a, an aspect that needs to be addressed on a strategic level, because in order for you to be able to ingrain um, your employees and convey the, or the organization's culture, it's not just writing up an HR um, policy or memo and saying, okay, well, our culture is we are customer centric. Let's say Amazon. Amazon looks to be the number one customer centric, centric company in the world. Amazon has uh, teams working around the world. And it's not just about saying we are customer centric. It's that every single aspect of the organization's processes are being done with that culture in mind. So every mm -hmm. single employee has to be aligned with that culture and their behavior basically reflects that culture. It's not so much a statement, but it's basically a it's basically getting through to them um, in the way that they behave and the way that they convey information. Obviously, that's a lot more work for HR managers because you're probably going to have at least one person, one, and I, and I think um, that might even be too little, but you're going to have at least one person addressing this aspect within the organization itself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers the question. It does, yes. And what would you say, um, because obviously some of the people are uh, perhaps resistant to change, whereas others are more able to adapt quicker. How would you deal with, say, those who don't feel as comfortable with everything that's happening at the moment because it's happening so rapidly, um, you know, unable to perhaps learn or feeling as if the organization is not there to help them learn and provide that lifelong learning, you know, environment. So what would be the best way to kind of keep them motivated to address this issue and keep them in line? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> and I would like to say I have a magic wand. And you say abracadabra, hocus pocus, poof, yeah, they're all they're all now on board. Unfortunately, that's never going to happen. Why? Because we're all different human beings. We all have our own sets of beliefs, values, ideas. And it's also um, difficult to change people who don't see the value in mm -hmm. that change. 
So the first thing that I would say is, first of all, you have to be able to communicate to your uh, to your employees on all levels because resistance might not be coming from the person in, in um, I don't know, accounting, but it may be coming from the board of directors themselves. So the first thing is that you have to be able to effectively communicate why that change is there and why that change is beneficial, not just for the organization. Yeah, it, we're all, we will all be happy if the organization makes more profit, great. But what's the benefit in each specific employee? If you use the you view, which is, I'm not talking about me, but I'm always thinking about you putting myself in your shoes, then that's going to get a lot further in helping uh, convince people or helping them to see why this change is good. Now, that being said, there are times when you could be talking until you are blue in the face um, and you're not getting through because there are some people who will be resistant to change, even if the truth is smacking them right in the face. And unfortunately, that is that is the reality. But since you are the HR uh, team in that organization, you will already know who those people are. <laughs> so you already know because the department head will have already told you, well, be careful with John, because we know that he tends to cause lots of issues and he's never happy when there are changes. Even if the changes, now you get to leave half an hour early. Mm -hmm. So. You will already know the people that um, are more resistant to change. And so the great thing is that you can tailor make an approach to each individual employee, especially uh, thinking about the ones that will have objections uh, regarding that change. Perfect. Um, I guess maybe it's just because we have so many, um, we have a variety of people coming from different countries here today. Um, we would be interested to know, guys, from your experience, because some of you are already in the field or interested in this industry, have you perhaps encountered, um, you know, the, the cultural differences that we're speaking about today or the, or the resistance from some people? Have you maybe met someone who doesn't see the point in HR at all? Um, anything you'd like to share from personal experience? Or have you perhaps worked with within multicultural teams? So Lena and Gainas, you guys. Well, I also, I also had a, a, a quite a fun question. <laughs> Who prefers what um, work ethic, US versus Spanish, as you mentioned? <laughs> Something I'm not a bit more. That. No. I can't. <laughs> I can't. Well, that might be a bit I'll quiet. just say. I'll just say. Take the best of both worlds. Yes, that's correct. That's it. I guess it all depends. <laughs> okay. Well, since. We don't have any answers from the guys here. Uh, perhaps let's just um, ask, well, address really the essential skills that you think are needed within this industry. So maybe personality traits or maybe some certain knowledge or even, uh, you know, even practical skills that it's wor worth kind of developing. Um, and maybe even in general, I would also ask, do you think to go into HR industry, would it be beneficial to have a degree tailored to this? Do you know what I mean? So some yeah. people seem to believe that, well, I've done psychology, so I know about the different motivation types. Um, I know about interpersonal communication, so I could just go into it naturally. So how, how would this particular degree benefit you, help you? take your career that extra level um, and is it needed so for someone it might not be needed how do we kind of di differentiate and how do we um who is this program tailored to and yeah. maybe if we think back to the skills that it will help you develop and the practical knowledge okay well one of the great things that i actually tell my uh on-campus students at, at gbsb global is that they are already acquiring so many soft skills without even realizing it because mm -hmm. uh, to be able to achieve uh, success in today's workplace, it's a combination of hard skills, which you've learned, uh, technical skills, like you're an engineer, so you have to mm -hmm. learn math and equations, whatever, but you also have to have a number of soft skills. And um, the number, the soft skills have a lot to do with emotional intelligence. And whether you are a psychologist 
or uh, you are somebody who studied media studies <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, from New York, emotional intelligence is going to get you a long way. And that's not something that you can learn in a course. Mm -hmm. That is something that you learn by having a very wide and ample perspective of people from different walks of life, people from different backgrounds, people who have different value sets than you. Mm -hmm. For example, um, here in Spain, there are people who have never left their towns. Well, like I'm sure it happens in lots of different countries. And what I always say is you need to travel. You need to travel. You need to immerse yourself in other experiences. See life as another person would see it because what we take for granted here doesn't happen across the globe the same way. So these kind of um, soft skills, it's not like you can sign up to a multicultural class. Mm -hmm. and say okay well now I'm going to learn so in Japan I have to bow like this and then uh, in Spain I give two kisses and in the US I shake my hands okay that will help you to understand protocol and specific ways of greeting people but it's not going to give you that emotional intelligence mm -hmm. and that's going to give you by immersing yourself um, in an organization or in a course where you're going to have people from all over the world and you're going to have to be able to work as a team with people that are completely different than you. Now, that being said, uh, there are, of course, a number of hard skills that you have to know in HR and especially in today's competitive HR world, because even if you got a psychology degree uh, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, just because you know that there is personality type A and personality type B doesn't mean that you're going to be effective in being able to manage those people. You're going to have to understand what makes people tick and how to get those people to um, become aligned with your organization's purpose. And that's how that's what you learn in these in this course, because mm -hmm. this course immerses you with uh, both the theoretical aspects, but also through a number of different case studies, through being in contact with uh, by having guest speakers that are in the industry. They are dealing with the day to day challenges and they are sharing that knowledge with you. And this is not something that you're going to get in a different academic setting that is perhaps more um, theory based, for mm -hmm. example. So GBSB has the good mix. And then, of course, the fact that we are a we are the first Microsoft school, I believe, in Spain. That's no, correct. Spain. They are not the only one, yeah. We are the only one. So, of course, this gives you lots of valuable. It gives you an edge on everybody else because the tools that if you go to another course, you'll have to learn when you're actually working, you're actually going to master here when you are when you are studying. So. Mm -hmm. This is, like I said, a combination of soft skills and hard skills that are going to help you achieve success. Even if you've even done HR as your as your bachelor's degree, for example, mm -hmm. because, well, like people say in Spain, el saber no tiene cabida. Uh, learning is never is never going to be a step in the wrong direction. When you learn something, that's always going to be something that you carry with you. And it's not like a Michael Kors bag. Now it goes out of style and that's it. No, learning, you always mm -hmm. carry it with you from now until the day you die. So it's always a good investment. Perfect. We even have someone agreeing <laughs> with yeah, you. Thanks for this great advice. So guys, this is the last chance. <laughs> if you do wish to ask any questions or maybe say your thank yous, and of course we wish everyone the best of luck we do hope um to see as many of you as possible joining us um as part of this program or perhaps you can check out other progr programs and see what suits you best um i think we've pretty it was my pleasure as well and yeah, sorry for you. keep no. <laughs> going on and on and on but as you guys can see when i'm passionate about something i could talk for hours so Thank you guys thank you. for your patience as well. Thank you. thank you, Anastasia, for setting this up. Thank you. I would love to be a part of this and any other um, program that you have. Sure, we'd love that too. Thanks a lot, everyone, again. Thank um, you, everybody. Yeah. Wish everyone a nice evening or <laughs> whatever, whatever uh, time of the day it is for everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to everybody. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Thank